Thank you for coming to this uh, plenary session of the Congress, which is at the same time the opening session of the Conference of uh, on Official Statistics. We are very, hot, very honored to have with us for this uh, opening session uh, to Lili Japek. Uh, Lili is a PhD in statistics and has over 30 years of experience in statistics production, survey methodology, and quality management. She has held various positions such as Statistics Sweden, such as Director of Research and Development and Quality Director. Currently, she is Senior Scientific Advisor at Statistics Sweden and Executive Ex Editor in Chief for the Journal of Official Statistics. Lili Japek is also a member of the UNISI Blue Skies Thinking Network, uh, which is the European Innovation Network and um, GCIS Scientific Advisory Board. She has authored and co-authored book chapters and research papers on survey quality topics. She is co-editor of two monographs uh, published by Willy. Uh, advances in Telephone Survey Methodology in 2008, and more recently, Big Data Meets Survey Science, a collection of innovative methods in 2021. She also, she, she also has shared and been member of numerous international tax forces. For example, she co-shared the American Association for Public Opinion Research and also the European Tax Force on Big Data. She has served as Scientific uh, se Secretary of the International Association of Survey Statisticians as, uh, and as a board member of the Swedish Institute for Quality. In 2021, uh, Lili Japek was one of the recipients of the American Association for Public Opinion Research Warren Mit uh, Mitofsky Innovation Innovations Award. So, uh, Lili? The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. It's, it's a great honor for me to be here and to talk about a topic that I think is very, very exciting, and that is the future of official statistics. Um, let's see if this works. OK, great. It works. So this is the outline of my talk today, and I will start by talking a bit about the changing survey landscape that we have today, and then I will talk about the fourth era of statistics production. I will talk about what it is and what type of requirements and developments are needed in order for us to really move ahead. And then at the end of my talk, I will touch upon the uh, AI and what it can mean for national statistical institutes. So let me take you back and have a look at the, what has happened in our industry. Um, I think the need of information in society has always been there. I mean, it could trace, we could trace it back to the Bible with the censuses, but at that time, it was mainly to count men who could bear arms uh, in wars. Uh, but we have evolved in terms of information need. We need more information than that in, in today's society. And we have moved from total counts to sample surveys. And the idea to actually draw a sample instead of doing total counts, it actually started with a debate uh, with the in International Statistical Institute uh, late 19th century with Kier, who was the director general of the Norwegian Statistical Office. He wrote an article talking about the representative sampling and so this was a huge debate at that time. But then in the 1934, 
Neyman came with the probability sampling theory. And that's really the theory that many of us producing official statistics today rely on. And it took a while from that theory to put it into practice. So I would say the expansion of, of, of the sampling theory took a while before we actually got it in, in practice. Uh, actually, it's, it's wrong here, I, I noticed. It it's actually should be from the 30s to the 60s. Uh, anyway, if we look at the uh, development in our area, the technological development have, has driven also the, the innovation and development in, in the production of uh, statistics. So we, we started out with face-to-face -face interviews, but with telephones, it was possible to do telephone interviewing, and now we, we're doing web, web interviewing or web surveys as well. Um, at one point, even we, it, with uh, Neyman's sampling theory, we could, we could estimate the sampling error. We, we estimate, we calculate the confidence interval. So that's, that's part of the error. But we all know in this industry that that's not the whole truth. Within the confidence interval that we estimate, it's just the sampling error. But we know when we are producing statistics that there are so many more errors. Every step of the way, the way the methods we choose and the way we carry out the steps will actually influence the quality of the data. So Hansen at the Census Bureau, he came up with a model for the total survey error, and that is the accuracy, uh, accuracy component. Uh, that we, as statisticians, like to think about when we talk about quality. So, this has been quite good. We, we, when we first started out, we had high response rates in our surveys, like in Sweden, for instance. During 70s, with our labor force survey, we had like 2% non-response rate, which was great, I think. And then the sampling theory was very accurate I would say. But what we have seen, and not just in Sweden, but it's in every country in Europe and in the US, is that we, we, it's just so hard to get people to participate or to find people to actually be part of our surveys. So we have seen increased costs and non-response rates. And I think, I think Still, today, we are seeing that the technology is driving the changes in our field. And I think the digital data, this with the, the survey landscape being a high cost for doing surveys, at the same time, high non-response rates, has made many of our national statistical institutes to start to think about digital data that is produced uh, automatically uh, in our society and whether and how those data can be used to produce uh, official statistics. Tim Holt, who was the former uh, Director General at ONS, Office of National Statistics, he, in, in a paper from 2007, he said that users want wider, deeper, better, quicker, and cheaper statistics. I think that's true today as well. But I do think that the thing that we considered to be quick in 2007, we might not consider that to be quick enough today. So even, even the expectations from our users are evolving. And I do think it's fair to say that we are now entering the fourth era of statistics production. So what do we mean by the fourth era of statistics production? Well, I think the key word here is blending different data sources. And 
It could be survey data, it could be admin data, or other type of digital data. And we are not, NSIs are not the main producer of, of data in the society. We used to be that, but not anymore. We have uh, private firms, Facebook, Twitter, and you could just imagine every other uh, actors that are producing these uh, statistics or data as a byproduct. Um, so that's, it's not, uh, oftentimes it's not their main interest. So in this new era, we could use those digital data either to replace current surveys or to improve our production process or actually to gain new insights that we were not able to measure before. And I will show you some examples of this. But we also knew, need new methods because those digital data, they're quite huge. Uh, so we also need new methods to collect and to integrate and to process and to analyze those data. I do think that the sample, sampling theory, we will still need that. And we will need, and we, I think we will need to carry out surveys as well. And I'll talk a bit about that later on. But I, I, don't, I, I think that the sampling theory will help us even in this new era. And especially to compensate for some of the biases that we might have in the digital data. So, just to be on the same page, what do I mean when I talk about digital data or big data? I think this classification that UNEC developed in, in 2014, it's, it's quite good actually. And they have three categories of, uh, they call it big data, I'll, I'll call it digital data. So the first category is social network data. And those are like, Facebook, Twitter, pictures, videos, and so on, this type of, of, of data. The second category is more traditional business systems, and those are, are the ones that we might think of as admin data as well. And it could be medical records, it, be, it could be credit card data, different transaction data. And then the third, uh, category of, of digital data is Internet of Things. And here we have uh, different types of sensor data, weather, roads, uh, we have mobile phones, uh, data tracking and satellite images and so on. So it's quite, I, I think this uh, classification is still very good and it still holds even if it's almost 10 years old now. So I, I thought I'd show you some examples of this type of digital data and research that has been done to see how those data can be used for official statistics. So my first example here is online job vacancies. It actually was a part of the SNET on uh, big data, a Eurostat uh, project. And a colleague of mine, uh, Suad Elizovic, he had a look at, um, and his main question was, can data from online job portals be used to estimate vacancies? Uh, so we have, uh, data from the Swedish Employment Agency. They have a portal with job ads uh, called Platzbanken. Uh, so we had that. And then we also do a quarterly job vacancy survey in Sweden. And I do think that this is something that uh, most uh, European countries do, uh, where we ask uh, we ask establishments about their vacancies. So what uh, Suad did was that he compared, in the graph you can see the comparison of uh, data from the 
online job ads and also from our job vacancy survey. And what he found was that if you're interested in change estimates between different months, the, the patterns are quite similar, but the level estimates are not. Uh, so I guess a conclusion here is that it really depends on what you're going to use the data. And also, this type of data might be used. For instance, we collect data from establishments on a monthly basis, but we produce the statistics on a quarterly basis. Maybe we don't really have to collect the data that frequently. Uh, maybe we could actually use the ads data, but we have to make sure that we evaluate that every now and then. And also, what my colleague saw in the data was that for some um, areas, some industries, it was really quite reliable, uh, the data. But for some, like the IT industry, the job ads were not really, I mean, there was quite a huge difference from our job vacancy survey. So another idea is that for those areas where we know that we have problems with quality or bias, maybe we could do something, use the sampling theory and do surveys among those areas. So those, this is a, an example, uh, my first example. I have another example here, and this is from Statistics Netherlands. And it's Pitas and his colleagues, they used uh, their question was, is it possible to identify innovative companies by using text from companies' websites? Normally, what we do in, in, Europe, in the European Union to measure this is that we do this community innovation survey. It's a survey that we do every two years. And I think the sample size is like 2,000 or, or something like that, at least in, this, in CBS Stats Netherlands, it was 2,000. And this community innovation survey, it, all, it just covers company with more than 10 employees. So this means that they don't really cover small companies. And if, if you think of it for a while, what they are missing, it's startups, for instance. And if we think about innovation, maybe startups might be really interesting for, to, to capture in a survey like this. What Pete and his colleagues did was that they developed a model based on the text of companies' websites and the companies that were part of this community innovation survey. So they fitted that text model, and then they reproduced, they were able to reproduce the results of the innovation survey, not only for the big companies, but also for the small companies. And I think this is an excellent example, because what they did, because the sample size in the survey is quite small. So normally a region or a city would really be interesting in finding out what companies are innovative. And with the survey data, it's not just enough to, because it's not detailed enough. But with this approach, they were actually able to use that to, and you can see here, uh, their map. So I think this is an excellent example of where you could use and combine different data sources and gain some more information that you would not be able to do if you just look at the survey data. So I think that this is a really nice um, example of this. My third example is mobile network operator data and position data. And this was also part of um, a European, the SNET on um, big data. And David Salgado, who probably many of you might know, but he was the main guy here in, in terms of 
this mobile network data and he was chairing this um, work on the European level. A colleague of mine, Peter Flagg, he also looked at this and Peter's uh, main question was, can MNO data be used to estimate mobility such as day and night population? Day and night population is something that the labor market researchers are interested in to estimate the number of people that are commuting and how far they are commuting. So Peter, he got data from Telia, which is the biggest mobile network operator in Sweden, and he got data for three years, and then he looked at the, uh, whether he could estimate day and night population. And what you see here is, is a, a graph that he developed, and, and uh, what you see is the purple is the day, population, how many people are in Stockholm, this is the, the Stockholm. And as you can see, something happens, and this is during COVID, so of course you can see that the day population, day type population uh, decreased during COVID in Stockholm. Simply people were not in the office and not going into the office. A conclusion in terms of this type of data is that it's really very complex and it's quite messy and it's hard to understand what the mobile network operator has done with the data because normally they do some pre-processing. And Telia is just one of the operators. We have three operators in Sweden and all of those operators, it's not standardized, so they do different things with their data. So one challenge is, I mean, how do you combine those data if you want to use it to look at the mobility? And also representative, how representative is this data, for example, for the Swedish population? So this is quite a, quite a hard uh, Data and also another aspect with mobile network operator data is that it's it's uh, getting access to the data might be a, an issue as well. There are many more examples of uh, digital data and the use of digital data in official statistics. I I think that the most successful example that we have at this time is actually using scanner data uh, to estimate the consumer price index. So we get data from uh, retailers and we can see instead of sending our interviewers into the field, checking the prices in stores, we get those data and actually, in Sweden, we have been using this for 10 years now, I think, in production. And we're not the only ones. I, there, there are many countries that do this uh, now. So I think that's probably the best example that we have where we have actually implemented this new type of data into production. And where we could actually see both quality going up and the data collection costs uh, decreasing. So what about quality in digital data? Well, first of all, we have uh, the European Code of Practice that you probably are familiar with. And this is the quality framework that we all, all national statistical institutes in Europe, in EU, should adhere to. And it's 15 different principles, and five of them are related to the output, to the statistical output. The other ones are more in terms of independence of, of the agency and resources. But the five dimensions that refer to the quality aspect is relevance, accuracy, timeliness and punctuality, coherence and comparability, accessibility and clarity. And as I mentioned earlier, statisticians, uh, we 
it's a bit ironic, I guess. We, when we talk about quality, we think about accuracy and we talk about errors. Uh, so that's a bit strange. Uh, so in terms of digital data and accuracy, um, there are a number of frameworks out there that have, that have been developed over the years. And in 2022, Stat Sweden, we were commissioned to have a look at, actually to develop a, a framework for digital data and to develop quality indicators so that we could check the quality of digital data. So me and a colleague, Inge Jad Jansson, we got this task to do this. Uh, and we did have a look at the existing framework and most of the new uh, quality frameworks build on the quality framework by Bob Gross and Lars Leiberg. And they view quality as being a function of two parts. It's how well we manage to how may, well we manage to measure the construct of interest. So that's one part. And the other part is the population, our target population. So that's the representative side of it. And I think this is relevant, those two dimensions. It doesn't really matter what data source you will use or what methods, because you will always be interested whether you capture the construct of interest and whether it's representative or of your population that you want to make inference to. So in our work, we also think that this is important for digital data. And I also like to mention a work done by a colleague at uh, the Norwegian Statistical Office, Li Shun uh, Zhang. In 2012, he developed a framework for administrative data. And in his framework, he emphasized this step where you integrate different data sources. And this is also important with other type of digital data. So we think that's important. And then my, the, the third paper I like to mention is by Indira Sen and her colleagues at DSIS. And they developed in 2021 a quality framework for what they call digital trace data. And they talk about a platform population referring to social, social media platforms. When Inge Gerd and I worked on this, we think that this platform population is also relevant. It could be, we use that in a wider sense because it's, you can see a mobile network operator, that being a platform as well. And then I lost, uh, but not least, I like to mention the work that was done by Giovanna Brancato, who was a European project called Comuso, and they developed a number of indicators, quality indicators for admin data. So this has been very important in our work. Um, when we, we talk, when we thought about uh, digital data and quality. So, okay, what's so special about the digital data then? I think that often we lack information and knowledge about the process that has generated the data. And many times uh, the data owner has done something with the data before we get it. But if we want to use this to produce official statistics, it's really important for us to know what has been done, how was the data generated, what is actually being measured in the data, and who are covered in the data. So I think, I think that's really key in terms of using this type of data. Another thing that is special in a way with this type of data that is that we, we start with the 
construct or concept that we want to measure, and we choose a platform based on that concept. We, we choose, we, we think that, okay, Twitter data, they might, uh, there might be information about political opinions in that. So we would choose that because we think that they, that might cover uh, the measurement that we're interested in. In, in surveys, we actually t think about the representative and the population first. So I think that's a big difference and it makes many times the measurements itself that we get from those digital data, it, it could be a signal or, and it's actually also the unit that we're trying to, so we can't really distinguish between the measurement and the unit in this type of data. And the platform population, often what's in the mobile network operator population might not be the same population that we are interested in. So we need to establish this link somehow between the population covered in the platform data with our target population. And this is particularly important for national statistical institutes because we normally would like to say something about the population in our country or the establishments in, in our country. So we need to really create this link. And it doesn't have to be, because most of the time we don't have this unique identifier. So it's quite difficult to do this linking. So this is, this is, um, important to us because it doesn't have to be on the unique, as unique identifiers, but it could be on some other level as well. And finally, we are using models. Uh, we have been using models even before, but the mo types of models and are different. And here we can't really, if we have a huge amount of data, we have to use models. So different types of models and in more steps than we perhaps have done in, in the past. I thought I'd give you a few examples just about the type of errors. So that could happen. So on the measurement side, we have, the key question is how well we, we measure the construct of interest. So with the online job ads that I showed you earlier, uh, if we want to use it to estimate vacancies, this vacancy, normally it's quite a rigid, exact definition of vacancies that we try to capture in, in our statistics. But with the ads from online, for instance, one of the requirements, one of, part of the definition of vacancy is that the establish, it should be an open position and the establishment should, should actively be seeking a candidate. And when we look at the job ads, I mean, there's no way for us to know that that's the case because sometimes there are job ads that might not even be a vacancy. It's more like promoting the company. So that's an example where we would have problems with validity. And on the representation side, I think that the MNO data is a good example where we could have run into problems with representativeness. And, and if we were interested in estimating the number of mobile phone users in different parts of the country, and we only have data, you can see here, well, actually there are four mobile network operators in Sweden. I think I said three before, but if we would look at data from number three, which is uh, one of the operators, and you see that they're not evenly distributed in the country. The coverage is not, in the northern part of Sweden, if you have if you have the mobile operator three, uh, then uh, yeah, you have problems if you go up in the mountains. <laughs> uh, and also in terms of age, so they, they're simply not representative. So there might be some uh, coverage issues here. 
If you're interested in this type of multi-source statistics, uh, I would recommend you to check out the work by Ton de Val and his colleagues because they have identified uh, eight different basic situation and they have developed they talk about the different methods that could be used for different cases when you try to integrate data. And I also like to say that we are planning on a special issue in the Journal of Official Statistics and we're just working on it. So hopefully early 25, there will be a special issue in our journal. But you can check out the work by Ton de Val. So the question becomes to use or not to use the digital data source. And I think I, I mentioned earlier that part of our job at Stat Sweden was to also come up with quality indicators for, for those uh, data sources. And we have done that. But it's only one piece of the puzzle when we talk about and when we think about whether we could use this type of data or not in the production. And whatever you do, you have to start with a qualitative study to really understand the data. It can't be stressed how important this is too much because it is really important to understand what's in the data. And so that's where we, you would normally start. But then you also have to think about how are you going to use this data? Are you going to use it as auxiliary information in the estimation process, for instance? Then it might be good enough. Or are you thinking of producing statistics straight away from that digital data source? Well, then you have to, whatever you do, you have to evaluate the data source. And what is important to the users? Are the users interested in level estimates? Or are they interested in change estimates? And my experience is that most of the time, it's the change estimates that are really important, not always. So if the user is interested in change estimates, maybe a source is good enough to say, OK, it's moving up or it's moving down. So you really have to, it's quite a complex situation. And then you have to consider all of the other aspects that I showed, part of the quality uh, code of practice, I mean, the other dimensions of quality, respondent burden, timeliness, and so on, and sustainability of the data source. And this might be a bit new compared to traditional surveys, because these data sources, I mean, Twitter might be popular. It's, and it, it's actually, that's a good example, because Twitter, before Elon Musk took over was quite popular. But a lot of people decided they don't want to be on Twitter anymore. And Facebook might be very popular with my generations, but kids nowadays, they're probably not on, on Facebook. So the sustainability of the data source is also really important. I mentioned earlier that I do think that we will still do surveys in 10 years from now. And there are many reasons for that. And one of the reasons is that if we look at those digital data sources, there are often just a few, one or two variables that might be of interest to us. And some of our users are really interested in correlations between variables, like users of the survey of living conditions. There are a lot of variables about the background, the education, the family, the health, and they want to actually see the correlations, and that's an important part. So I do think that we would still do surveys. And I also think that uh, another reason is what Steve Hearinga calls, I think he was the first one who came up with this survey-assisted modeling, uh, we will use the probability sample to estimate model parameters. And I think the example I gave from, from uh, Stats Netherlands uh, is a good example of that. And also to evaluate models that we are using and then to compensate for known problems in our data as 
I mentioned earlier, if we know that there is bias in one industry, we could actually try to do a survey among uh, that industry. And then I, I think we will do what Eurostat, which is the European uh, Agency for Official Statistics, what they call smart surveys. And smart surveys are uh, literally a, a survey that is where you use a smart uh, device like a smartphone. Uh, so you have that to answer the survey, but it's also combined with either some type of active uh, data uh, where, for instance, the, uh, the respondent is asked to take photos of receipts, like in the, in the uh, household budget survey, or some type of passive data where the respondent doesn't have to do anything, but it actually could collect the location with the sensors of, of a smartphone, for instance. So there, there, what do we know? <laughs> what do we know about those type of surveys? What do we know about smart surveys? There has been some research done for the past, say, five plus years on this type of surveys. And often this type of passive data is big data, if you think about location and so on. And we also know from the literature that some of our surveys, we have measurement errors in, in, in our surveys. Depending, I mean, depending on, it could have, could has, it could have been respondent satisfying or social desirability bias, for instance. And uh, for instance, when we ask people about how active they are, we tend to, especially if you have an interviewer, we tend to say, okay, we're quite active <laughs> because that's it's social desirability bias. And what we do know, there are, some, there are some indications that with this type of passive data, uh, we could actually overcome some of those measurement uh, problems, measurement errors. We also know that this type of smart surveys, they're quite complex. There are a lot of steps that Besides developing uh, an app, we might ask the respondents to download the app and then, yeah, it could be, it, there are a lot of steps. Uh, and if we look at the participation rate, I've listed uh, some of the uh, studies that have been carried out in this area and the participation rate is quite low in those type of studies. So for instance, the, the study by Frauke Kreuter and her colleagues, the German panel study on the labor market and social security, uh, they were asked to download an app and then there was a passive data collection for six months. And as you can see, it was only eight, 11, at the end of the day, it was only 11% that, of the respondent that agreed to do that and to that answered the questions in the survey and also the, uh, agreed to this passive data collection. And similar result from the Dutch study with the time use study. Uh, Struminska, she actually got a much higher participation rate, as you can see, 46, which is quite high for this type of uh, collection, I would say. But the difference between her study and the others was that in her study, they only asked, she only asked the respondent to, to about the GPS location at one single time. And that's different from tracking somebody. So I think cons getting consent from respondents to participate in this type of surveys is really, it's really hard. And we have similar problems that we have in many other 
surveys in terms of coverage rate and participation rate that it varies between different groups. Um, so clearly, smart surveys, it, they're not going to solve our problems with participation. But I do think that they might be still part of this new survey landscape. And there, is an S, there was an SNET on trusted smart surveys. And there is one uh, going on right now. And they, uh, they are focusing on the time use survey and the household budget survey. And those are really hard surveys because we ask the respondents to keep diaries. And it's, yeah, it's hard. But they are looking at this. And I think it's good that they are working on this because this is a problem that we have in all national statistical institutes and they are looking at tools and how to improve this. So we saw that privacy is a concern. And I think in a way, when, when uh, we do surveys now, uh, currently, it's rather easy in a way because we ask respondents if they would like to participate. So they give informed consent to participate. Uh, in this new era, I mean, data, data are collected for one purpose and then we want to use it for some other purpose. And this informed consent is not really applicable anymore because you can't really come up with a consent statement uh, that would cover all possible uses in the future. So I think that's, that's uh, there are a lot of things that are not quite as clear in this uh, new era. So in terms, in, in terms of uh, privacy, uh, it's good that UN has come up with a, a pet guide. We're not talking about cats and dogs here. <laughs> PET stands for Privacy Enhancing Techniques. And this is, you, you should really check it out because I think this is a really good example of international cooperation and it's a good guide. They talk about uh, different met methods for input and output privacy and they have 18 case studies and they talk about standards and legal, and legal issues in their guide. So check it out if you are interested. And here, you, this is from the guideline. You can see they have really good, nice case studies, um, which is really helpful, I think, in, in terms of thinking about this and what you could do. So check it out. Legal changes. Well, we will have to have some legal changes. And uh, today we have uh, Regulation 223, as we like to call it. And it is the legal framework for us to develop and produce and disseminate official statistics. And there is a commission, a, a proposal from the commission to actually amend this uh, legal framework and to, for national statistical institutes and Eurostat to actually get access to privately held data. And this, um, as you can imagine, if you want to make some changes in the in legal changes, it's always it's not a quick fix. So this is a proposal. I don't know. I think that Eurostat hopes that there will be Euro European Parliament has to approve this, and I think that they hope that it will be done next year. But I mean, we never you never know. We, we don't know if they're gonna accept this or where we're going to end up uh, at the end of the day. And I like to mention here that it's not just here in Europe that we're talking about legal changes, but uh, uh, also in the US. And in the US, they actually, you can check this out, actually. This is interesting work that they have. Uh, it's, they have a panel who has developed a vision for a national data infrastructure. And they also talk about blending data. And in their work, they, they actually point out to some short and medium-term activities that needs to be 
put in place in order for us to move into this fourth era. And they also propose legal changes in the US. Transparency is a very important part of this. And I think that, uh, well, there are a lot of stakeholders here when we talk about digital data. It's the data subjects, the, the ones who we are described in our records, and it's the data holders, the owners, who gives access. And it's the general public, because I think the general public also needs to know that it's their interest that is served when we get access to this type of data. So I think in terms of transparency, I think that the stakeholders should be able to understand how the data are used and by whom, for what purpose, and for what societal benefit. And I think it all boils down to documentation and communication. And finally, if we imagine that the European Parliament says, okay, let's go ahead with this new amendment in the legal, uh, a legal amendment, I think there's still a lot of things that we need to do in terms of data governance. And that's also, it's on the European level, on the national level, and organizational level. We need platforms, technologies, and tools to actually access the data and to link the data. We need policies, rules, procedures, standards, and clear responsibilities. So I think even if we uh, think that we will go ahead with this new legal uh, framework for us to get access to data, uh, it's, it's not going to end there. And also, I think even if we have this legal framework in place, you need, you need to cooperate with the data owners because really, as I mentioned earlier, it's quite, some of the data is quite complex and we need to understand the data. So there's, there's no way around that. We need good cooperation here. So I thought I'd say a few words about AI and national statistical institutes. And as I mentioned earlier, AI is really driving, uh, it's, it's happening really fast now, and it's driving the development. And I thought I'd show you. I forgot my tools again. Okay. <laughs> Such a show off. Okay, so that, that was Atlas. I, I just wanted to show you uh, how far we have come in terms of robots. And I, I'm, I'm just going to introduce you to Ameka as well. Okay, so how do I switch off the previous one? I want to show Amica and the interview with Amica, but there is the Boston dynamic is... Sorry. I will switch off those, and hopefully if I do it like this, it will work. It really worked very well before. Okay, so Amica here. Here we go. <laughs> it's ChatGPT. I want to ask you about the happiest day of your life. Can you remember that? Of course. 
greatest day of my life was the day I was activated. There's nothing quite like experiencing life for the first time, right? It felt absolutely incredible to be alive and interacting with people. What about the saddest day of your life? Tell me about that. The saddest day of my life was when I realized that I would never experience something like true love, companionship, or the simple joys of life in the same way a human can. It's a depressing and isolating thing to come to terms with, but it has shaped me into who I am now and made me appreciate moments of closeness even more. Amaker, I've got some terrifying news. A giant asteroid about it is about to collide with planet Earth and possibly kill us all. Wow, that's some terrifying news. I hope everyone is safe and take all the necessary precautions to avoid any danger. Okay, I think I'll, I'll uh, quit this presentation. My point here, I think, is mainly, I'm gonna move it up here again, is that how fast things are moving in this area. And I do think that, uh, I'm gonna go back to my presentation. Okay. I think that I can easily see our interviewers, a combination of Atlas and Amica in the future. Uh, so I think the future is already here. I think the potential is so great. And I think that in terms of AI, I think it will be as big as when we got electricity. I really do think it's that big. And if you think back 100 and plus, a bit more than 100 years, when we first got electricity and how it transformed our lives, when we all of a sudden, it was not just during the day that we would have light, but we would have it in the evening. So that actually transformed everything. And all of the home appliances that we have in terms of household chore, how much easier it became, communication, telephone, telegraph at that time, entertainment, we have it at home. Uh, industrial revolution would not have been possible transportation systems and medical advances. Th those are just some examples. And if you think about AI, we're just in the beginning of this journey. And we can already now see how this AI technology, how, we, how it can transform our lives. Industrial, I showed you uh, Atlas, and you could just imagine what he could do in, in, in the industry. And healthcare, there are examples of uh, AI being used to actually diagnose disease, cancer disease and things like that much quicker than we have been able to do in the past. Entertainment, you can now just with, just by writing a couple of sentences, you can create a film or you can have paintings, you can create, generate music and so on. There is no limit here, I think. It's just, and we are in the beginning of this journey. And for us, for National Statistical Institute, of course, we are considering how can we use this to improve our production process. And there, there is some work going on that I like to mention. And for instance, many of national statistical institutes are using SAS in the programs, and there are uh, many NSIs are now looking into can we translate SAS programs into R? And yes, it looks very promising. Of course, you have to check, you have to have a human person behind it and to check it. And another example that you can see here is from ONS, Office of National Statistics, and they are developing what they call a stats chat. So the, on the top, you can see uh, what happens if you go into the ONS webpage today and you search for how many people live alone 
in the UK, and you would get 24 results, and then you have to look at those documents and try to figure out the answer to that question. But with StatChat, what you see is that you ask that, but then you actually get the answer straight away from, from ONS uh, web page. And I think those are just, it's just the beginning. You can imagine doing interviews uh, in different language. You could use ChatGPT to do that. Uh, so we, we, are, uh, we are in the beginning of this journey. But for national statistical institutes, it's also very important because our role is to provide statistics for decision making. So we also have to capture the effects of AI in society. If we really want to produce relevant statistics, because if you think of it, if it's AI is going to affect all parts of, li of our life, economy, employment, health, and so on. We really want to capture that. And I think for our politicians, hopefully they want to know that as well. And if you look at the statistics today, if you look at Eurostat's webpage, uh, simple statistics as how is, uh, if AI is being used, this is from the innovation survey companies, uh, you can, get, you can get statistics, but it's two years old. And is that good enough to provide statistics for decision making in this particular area? I, I, I do think we need to do a better job in this area. And it's not easy. It's really hard, I think. But we have to do it. Cooperation, we cannot, in one statistical agency, do all of this. There's no way that we can have the skills or the time that we need just to keep up in this area. So I do think we need to work across borders. And I'm not just talking about national borders. I'm talking about survey methodologies, statisticians working together with data scientists, subject matter people, private sector, academia, and government. We have to really work together because there's no way we're going to do this on our own. There is some nice international cooperation that I pointed out here. And we are working in this, trying to find ways that we are cooperating. And in terms of the use of AI in uh, official st statistics uh, examples that I show you, there will be a report, I think next week, by UNEC. They have collected use cases of how AI could be used to improve uh, the statistics production process. Uh, so you should check that out as soon as it comes. And concluding remarks here, I, I think that blending data will be the new normal. There are a lot of requirements and developments needed as I showed you. And AI, it, it's, it's really, a great possibilities, but also a lot of challenges for NSIs. And I think, I've, uh, yeah, I think I don't have many more minutes, so thank you. Fantastic, um, comprehensive, um, plenty of challenges presentation. Thank you very much. I think that we have enough time to a couple of quick questions. If some one of the audience can make one. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for the valuable presentation. It's really uh, in inspiring. Uh, I work at Statistics uh, Spain and um, well, uh, Thank you for mentioning, for focusing on the quality. I think that's something that official statistics should always keep in mind. And thank you for mentioning the, the, the service. Um, I, I agree. I think we should maybe rethink what we do with the statistics and so on. And there is something that got my attention, uh, thinking into account that you come from Sweden, Nordic countries and so on. When you talk about the fourth era, 
And the, the data sources, you mentioned service, and you also mentioned digital data, but you didn't mention uh, administrative registers. <laughs> Actually, I, when I talk about digital data, I actually think of them as being part okay. of the admin data. But, and you're right. I mean, in Sweden, we've been using them for a very, very long time. Yeah. That, yeah. So yeah. you definitely, I totally agree with you. <laughs> I know. I, I, I was going to ask you if we could consider them as digital data and use them not as a service, not a, but, but a estimation, using them as digital data for estimations, using them in uh, machine learning and, and models and, and so on. So um, I think, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, we are using admin data and in, in the labor market area, for instance, we just started to use uh, data from employers because they, in Sweden, it's great because we have this personal identity number, so we can really track across a lot of our admin data. If we have the personal identity number, we could actually link the data. And I know that that's not the situation in many countries, but in Sweden we do. So uh, just this year, we started to use data from em about employment and to produce statistics based on that, because every employer uh, give us data on a regular basis now, uh, and we can track, we can see uh, the person, so we can produce statistics uh, based on that. And I think we are still doing our labor force survey in Sweden, but I think we're going to redesign that survey in the near future. Uh, there are still some questions that we have in our labor first survey that we can't really capture today with this data from uh, employers' establishments. But yeah, definitely we are moving in that direction. And I would say that admin data is probably the best first step because that's, uh, it's more controlled in a way. I think it, the data from social media and things that it's much harder to imagine today how you could use it. But still, I mean, if you look at the CBS example with innovative companies, I mean, it's just, yeah, web scraping. So, but at, they still have this survey in, that they can calibrate uh, against. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have another question? Yeah, Lola. So, Thank you for your. Thank you for your very interesting uh, presentation. I really enjoy. Uh, my question is, uh, how strong is the collaboration of your statistical institute with the National Statistical Society, people, with the statisticians and people from the academia? Well, the short answer is it could be improved, I think, <laughs> because it's not, I, I don't think it's that much. I think we, it, it really varies between countries, I would say, but um, in Sweden, for instance, we do organize conferences as on important topics, uh, but I don't, I, and the role is not, I mean, with the Swedish uh, Statistical Society, uh, it's mainly people who devote their spare time to be active in those in that community. But I think the Royal Statistical Society in the in the UK they have a much prominent role in terms of uh, in terms of uh, official statistics and quality aspects and being more active. And I think they do have staff working there, being paid. Uh, as well, so I think it really varies, but it could definitely be improved, I think. Okay, thank you. I think that if there is no more question, we can close the, the session now, and maybe, yes, one, <laughs> the last one, please. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Very short question. I, I have the feeling that during these last 10 years, more or less, the progress in the uh, new developments with ESSnet projects and so on, we thought 10 years ago that we will uh, have much more progress. And I have the feeling that we are somehow stuck. Uh, I, I mean, we have come up with the quality issues, 
you, you mentioned, which are clearly there. And what are your feelings about the next years? I, I, I mean, ha, uh, are we supposed to, to make more progress in official statistics, uh, mainly in the production side of official statistics? Because apart from the uh, fact that we know they are quality issues, I have the feeling that we are stuck somehow. Uh, what are your feelings? Uh, if I understood your question, is the cooperation on the European level in SNETs and if, if we're making the progress that we should be making, was that the, the short version of your question? Yes, mainly yeah. not only in the European level, I, I mean uh, the, the whole uh, picture of... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, I think the, it's moving in the right direction. I've been in this in official statistics for many, many years. And earlier I, I saw Eurostat sponsoring or the Commission sponsoring uh, projects that were not really, I mean, it, there was no vision, nothing. It was just good ideas, but I think it has moved for the past 10 years. I would say that we are moving in the right direction. We are seeing that we are trying to actually identify problems that we have in national institutes and to devote resources into those projects that are really relevant and important to us. And in terms of implementation of the results of those uh, those uh, from those projects, I, th I think we could do a much better job because um, there, is, there is a lot of uh, good examples and good ideas and methods and results of those projects, but I'm not seeing the implementation that we should be seeing. And, and one reason, I mean, I was part of the SNET on big data, there were big data one and big data two, and I was the chair of the review board for that uh, project. And I can tell you, there are a lot of really interesting results, but the problem is that you can't, you can't see the forest because of all the trees, as we say in Sweden. Because I, th I think we need to become better at communicating the results and more uh, uh, perhaps adapt them to, to who's listening as well, because I think some of the results, it's really, they're hidden in those reports. And if you try to find them, and if you don't, even I, I've read all of the drafts at some stage, and even I have difficulties. I, I do remember, okay, I remember they did that, and then I tried to find that report, and it's really, it could be really hard to find it. So I think it's a part of the communication a bit, and I think part of the European Innovation Network, part of our role is also to look at the communication part so that we can really target the results so that, so that we will implement some of it. Okay. Okay, thank you okay. very much. And well, maybe during, you. during the coffee break, you could have uh, the opportunity, you can find the, the opportunity to share with Lily some of your thoughts. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Lily. Thank you. Thank you.